Amen. Amen. Well, welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study. I hope you all have been enjoying um, the lessons um, thus far this month as we look at from Antioch and beyond. Um, so as we begin, I'm just going to lead us in a small word of prayer. Thank you, uh, Nina, for the wonderful prayer that you offered, um, interceding on behalf of us all. You definitely, um, definitely um spoke to God about everyone and every pretty much every issue that we're going through. Praise God. Hallelujah. Let's just back for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you, God, for this moment in time where we can come, Lord, and to study, to study your word, oh God, and to see what it has to say to us today, Lord. God, thank you, Lord, for this venue that we're able to, um, to, to be upon, Lord, the Zoom line and the Facebook line and the um, prayer line, God, where people can come from not just here, not just here, uh, close, but also from afar, God, to be able to lean in and to glean, Lord, with what it is that you have to say and to do, Lord, by using us, Lord. Thank you, Father, um, for this this um, this vessel here, this vehicle, God, in which we're able to um, preach, teach, and share the word of God. So, Lord, have your way, Lord, in this hour. Lord, I just submit myself to you, God, to be used by your glory, God. Lord, that they don't hear me, God, but that they hear you, God. Help us to have a robust conversation um, as we continue in this study of From Antioch and Beyond. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, give me a moment to share my screen. All right, move this up some, there we go. All right, so I was hoping um, we have some young people on the line. Destiny, I see you there and I'm curious, do you know who this person is on the screen? Um, Buzz Lightyear. There you go, yes, yes. It is Buzz Lightyear and he is from what movie? Do you remember? Toy Story. There you go. He's from Toy Story. And um he he was um a character when when um when Pastor had mentioned what the, where we were going with the study for this particular month that we were going to be talking about from Antioch and beyond. And for some reason, I'm a I'm a kid at heart. His his picture came into my head because he was one that was always looking to explore beyond the little toy box, Andy's little toy box. He was the one that was in the window, ready to go from infinity and beyond, and things like that where he he realized that the world was bigger than this little tiny area in which he was contained in. And so him and um, Woody would have these conversations because Woody liked to stay where he was, but Buzz Lightyear always wanted to go above and beyond to, to explore other things that were out there. And so um, in my teaching tonight, I want us to focus on succession. And um, as a theme scripture, I want us to think about this as we go through the lesson of Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, where it says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. And so I have a question for you. When I when you hear the word succession, what comes to mind? Succession. The next in charge. Ah, the next in charge, yes, yes, yes. Such as like with Queen Elizabeth with Prince Charles, right? She was the queen, and, and now that she's gone, her son is now taking on the responsibility of the kingdom. Yep. Um, anything else? What, what else? When we think about, you know, the next in charge and things like anything else come to mind? I'm curious. Succession. As we relate it even to ourselves. 
maybe, you know, when we think about succession, we think about our children, right? How, um, how, how, do, how do we plan for their success, right? How do we build them up, making sure that they are able to stand and to survive and to thrive in our absence? We realize that we're human. We're not always going to be here. You know, um, for me, I don't, I, and I, I think that I'm not one, just an isolated person that thinks this, but my desire is that our children would be better than we were, you know, I want to be able to expose them to more opportunities. I, I want them to have jobs, not just to make money, but jobs that they enjoy to do. I want them to, you know, have experiences that I did, may not have had or to build upon those experiences that that um that I, I I've had or or that my husband and everything had. You know, when we think about succession, even in business, you know, um, those of us that are, are business owners, we want to see this establishment continue when we're no longer able to manage it, um, that it would be able to continue to grow and to expand. And, and those that we train, you know, that are now making the decisions and managing the day to day, we hope that they share the same values and the same work, work ethic that the um, business was founded upon and to build upon it. We may think about our church, you know, we stand on a foundation that was laid in the early 1900s by a small community right there inside of um, Springfield on Ruby Street that met inside of a basement, you know, and now today, what do we see? We see this beautiful edifice, you know, um, the Antioch Baptist Church. We have three parking lots. We own a property, you know, and it didn't start like that. It started as a little small wooden church and look how it has expanded. You know, we want to see these things continue. We want to, it, it to succeed us. We want to see the succession of it. We want to see you know, the people, even inside of Antioch, as they continue to, to, to grow, there's families that have been there from the very beginning, you know, it was a, it is a place where we can raise our families, where they get Christian values, where the word of God is taught, where fellowship is happening, and it's growing from generation to generation. And so, you know, when we think about, you know, succession, I, I think about, you know, um, what teachers would say when they think about succession, they, they, they would say something like this, the best compliment that can ever be given to a teacher is for their students to come back and say, you made a difference in my life. I want, I, because of you, I was able to add in whatever you, you want to add in, become a teacher, um, you know, uh, move into, move, move into the, the profession of, 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 of my choice and things like that, because you poured into me, you cared about me, you have given me something that I was able to, um, to, to feed upon that, that grew me, you know, um, and brought me to encourage, it, it encouraged me, it spoke, it spoke to me. And so, you know, this, these are some things that, you know, we want to talk about as we're thinking about succession. And so for a working definition, I want us to think about succession as this, as setting up the next generation to stand in your stead. And it's a sense of inheritance. And as we think about, you know, like this definition, we must, we also have to, um, you know, understand that with succession, there's also a sense of urgency that comes with it, right? Because again, we're not always going to be able to do these things. And with that urgency, it means that we have to put our affairs in order if we're going to take succession seriously and, and if we have something worth passing on, right? So I'm going to pull this one um, example because I think that's all that I will have time to actually get through tonight um, as we talk about, you know, from Antioch and beyond, as we think about our families, as we think about our church, as we think about anything that we're looking to build. And so we're going to first start 
uh, let's see. Here with the account of Elijah. And for those that had sat in the leadership summit um, supper session, some of this may sound familiar to you, um, but what I did for tonight, I, I added a little bit more so that we could dive a little bit deeper and hopefully bring about um, a, a, a grander discussion around where we're going. We're looking at 1 Kings chapter 18 and 19, where we see Elijah. And Elijah had just had this mountaintop experience where he challenged the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel and um, on whose God is greater. And so we know that, you know, in that Elijah wins. And so, you know, what what did Elijah actually do? He 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 sat up there and he spoke truth to power. There was an issue that was going on with 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 um idol worship, and he confronted King Ahab and he tells him that he has forsaken the commandments of the Lord and follow Baal. So my question to you is what commandment was Elijah speaking of when he says that you had forsaken the commandment of the Lord? And you followed Baal. What what commandment was that? Uh, to uh, not have any other gods. Mm -hmm. Yes, no other gods before me. And so Elijah assembled the 450 prophets of Baal at Mount Carmel, and they do this altar challenge. Who can call upon their God um, to rain down fire and consume the sacrifice? He even allows them to choose the first bull and, um, and to call on their God first. And we know that, you know, they were out there all day, you know, nothing's happening. They become more extreme and they start cutting themselves and praying louder and, you know, being more demonstrative of, you know, reaching their God and, and nothing happens. And then it's Elijah's turn. And so he takes the bull and he cuts it up and he puts it on the altar that he had had repaired because there was all, all there was an altar already there um, that that was um, for the Lord, but it was damaged. And so he repairs the altar and he places these 12 stones around the altar, which represent the 12 tribes of Israel. And then he digs a trench around the altar and he um, puts the wood on and the, the offering on top, and he does something really strange. He puts water on it, on the sacrifice, on the wood. You know, he, he totally saturates it to the point where the trench is even now filled with water. And what do we know about water? Water doesn't burn, right? Doesn't burn. <laughs> Right, <laughs> what it doesn't burn. So he's creating what seems to be an impossible situation. But what do we know about God? All things are possible. God is an, is an, is almighty and he is an awesome God. And so he calls upon the name of the Lord and God rains down fire and consumes the offering, proving that the God of Elijah who is our God, is the almighty God. Elijah, Elijah then he slays these prophets of Baal. Um, he, he then prophetically speaks about rain coming, which there had been no rain in three and a half years. They were experiencing an extreme drought. And, and, and so, you know, he's doing all of these things. And then lastly, he, he goes, he, he runs. He, he's, empowered to run 25 miles to the city Jezreel, which is a fortified city. He out, he outraces Ahab, who is on a chariot, and gets there. I mean, this is just some phenomenal stuff. You know, he, 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 is, he is so anointed right now at this particular time um, by the power of God in him that he's able to do all of this. He was having what we call a mountaintop experience. And I want to pause there for a minute because, you know, 
we do, we, we have these mountaintop experiences, you know, when we, we, we've um, just been through, you know, seeing a miracle, God has brought forth healing. We, we see it when, when God has done a mighty work using us, you know, or, or using us or, or us seeing, you know, the mighty hand of God in action where doors have been opened, you know, where we saw God move in such a way that, it just left us in awe, you know, we, we've had those times where it seems like a Kairos moment where time stood still, still and it's just me and God, you know, and, and, and it's just awesome and we don't want to lose that moment where it's like, can I just stay here, you know, wow, God, look at what you're doing when we sit up there and look out, you know, at all of the things that God has done. We can have those mountaintop experience. Have you ever ex experienced a mountaintop experience? Somewhat. I see you, Lizzie. She's like, ah, maybe. Yeah. Well, I can say for sure I have. You know, where where it it, it those moments where you know that you know that you know that. Have you ever been in a service where the spirit is so high, you know, maybe it was an Easter or, you know, a men's day, women's day or something like that. And the spirit is just so high in the church, you know, where it's like, I don't want to leave this place. It's just like, I need to be here. And you come back the next week and like, what happened? Everything is just quiet and dismal. There's a few people in the pews, nobody acts like they want to praise the Lord today. That's the difference between your mountaintop experiences and your valleys, right? And the thing is, is that when you do have mountaintop experiences, guess what? There are also those valleys where we, when we're in the moment of a mountaintop experience, we're not necessarily thinking about those next moments. And sometimes those downs, you know, can be just as extreme as those highs were. And we have to be very careful about that because we see Elijah getting ready to hit one of those downs, you know, and, and the truth of the matter is ministry can be exhausting. Let's be honest, you know, and I'm not just talking about the preachers, but whatever your ministry is, whether it's your ministry could be your marriage. You know, it can be exhausting at times. Parenting is a ministry in and of itself. Raising kids, if you're doing it in a godly fashion, it can be exhausting. You know, whatever your, your gifting or your anointing is, if you're using it, at times you will have times of exhaustion. And so when I think about this, I, I think about, you know, the adult. Let's use the duck as an example. You see a duck on the water, right? And it looks so beautiful, especially if it's a swan or something like that. And what do they do on the pond? They just glide across the water so elegantly. So, you know, but what you're not seeing is what's happening underneath the water. Because what's happening underneath the water is that their little feet are going like this. Underneath the water, they're going at a really high rate of speed and they're coordinated so that on top of the water, they're able to move very gracefully where that is what we see. And that's the same way it is in our ministry. So, you know, those kids, they, they, they sit on the pews looking very beautiful on a, on a Sunday morning, but nobody realizes that they threw up twice, they pooped, you know, we had to change clothes and everything else. Toys are spread all over the phone ring. Husband can't find his tie. Wife can't find her shoes. All kinds of stuff. Arguing in the car, trying to get to the church and everything else. But when we get there, we sit there like little angels, like, oh, we just woke up this way and this is how we are you know but the truth of the matter is there's some exhaustion that got us to this place when we think about you know like even the journey of preachers and teachers or anyone else that has to stand up in the house of the lord on any given sunday morning there's there's study that takes place there's rehearsals that take place there there's there's time away from family um you know if we're doing it 
and doing it right. There, there's social events that and engagements that we sometimes have to opt out of. Sometimes we have to take time off of work to do ministry. You know, there, there's those sleepless nights and those early mornings. And I know I'm talking to somebody out there because we've all been through it. And so sometimes ministry can also be very, very lonesome, you know, um, because you do find yourself doing ministry in that study, taking those, 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 those moments away from everyone so that you can spend time with the Lord. It is a labor of love. And so Elijah he is a prophet of God and he's doing the work of ministry and he's exhausted. And he was experiencing at that moment, those gowns of ministry. He ended up in the wilderness underneath a broom tree. And so he's there and he's feeling lonely and he's tired and he's hungry and he's thirsty and he's scared for his life because he knows Jezebel is seeking to kill him and he's weary. And so he's, and all of this is happening so much so that he asks God to take his life. Now that, 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 that serious exhaustion. So we have to be very careful how much we're putting on others. Um, they, we, people seem to, you know, when, when you're, when you're in certain positions and things like that, as, and, and God has grace and everything upon us where sometimes it looks like it, the job is so easy, you know, but really it's that duck on the pond that it comes out gracefully, but underneath this is what's happening, peddling and trying to stay afloat. And I think about, you know, those caregivers, those that, you know, are taking care of maybe parents or, you know, loved ones and things like that. And they're there morning, noon, and night, and they're meeting the needs of the loved ones. You know, I would say this, if, if you know someone that's in no, that's doing that, give them some relief, help them, you know, you do your part, you know, as be a regular presence, you know, to um, to help them and assist them with that. You know, if you know someone um, who has, is a parent of little kids, come over, ask to watch the kids, you know, and when you come over, don't, don't just sit on the couch, but jump in, you know, to do some of the things that, that are needed. Um, even in the workplace, you know, so many times they're like, I'm just going to do my job and that's it. I'm not doing no more. I'm watching the clock, five o'clock. I'm out. I'm not, I'm, you got your job to do. I got my job to do. But sometimes, you know, when we see our coworkers and our bosses stress, why can't we just lean in just a little bit more to help, you know, relieve the stress level, you know, whatever it is, we we can definitely do that. And even in the church, you know, um, there there's a job there for everyone. There should be no one just coming to church on a Sunday morning, leaving and coming back the next Sunday morning without doing any type of service unto the Lord. There's so many things that you can do, whether it's joining, you know, some of the ministries that exist or even, you know, um, new ministries that maybe God is calling you to and has given you gifts and talents to do. There's so much that can be done. So, so definitely, you know, find your place it, and, and God can use anyone, you know, there's, it's not your typical, you know, I need to be a preacher. I need to be a teacher. No, there's so many administrative things, um, singing, ushering, there's custodial, community outreach, card writing, whatever it is that you want to do, you can do it unto the Lord and unto God's people. So we need to get busy. And for any reason that you feel so, I'm sorry, I, 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 I wish I could, but I just can't be prayerful about it. And be thankful and open your mouth and let the people that are doing it know their labor of love is not in vain. Amen. All right. So for those that are sitting in those seats of exhaustion, I want to say this to you. God sees you and he does send aid. Don't 
reject the aid because it comes from a form you may not understand. Sometimes he sends things in little boxes. Sometimes he sends it in big boxes. Sometimes there's no box at all. It's just there. Take the rest when it's offered to you. Twice, twice an angel came and ministered to Elijah, giving him bread and water and told him to rest. Elijah listened and he rested. And he took the food and the water that was offered to him, and it gave him enough strength to run for 40 days. And after the 40 days, he then has another encounter with God. And in this encounter, he wants to hear God. And so the wind blows and, and, and it's splitting the mountains and the rocks and it's followed by the earthquake and the fire. And Elijah was expecting God to show up in these wonderments, but God wasn't there. Why do you think Elijah expected to see God in these tremendous supernatural happenings? I'm going to open that as a question for you all. Why did he think that God should? Anybody want to answer? You you froze a little bit. So could you repeat what you, that last part of your statement? Sure. I was saying, why do you think Elijah expected to see God in such a tremendous supernatural way? You know, we got the wind and um, we got the, the, the earthquake and we got the fire and Elijah's there, Lord, where are you? Where are you? But God wasn't in any of that. Why do you think Elijah was expecting him to be in it? Because God was regarded as great and terrible. So they, they looked at him as this, he, I'm sure, awesome. So these are these are larger than life events. I would expect that, you know, the one who is able to control all things, he would he would definitely be in something this magnificent. Yeah. What did he just experience? You know, right. He made this, this the fire on Mount Carmel, <laughs> right? Here it is. God is raining down fire. And I'm so glad you used that word. You said terrible. I want to tell everyone, um, terrible is used, and in, in, in I, in, I know you are a King James lover. Ter the word terrible is used to express, you know, God in, um, the new, in the King James version. God is terrible. That, that word terrible in the Hebrew is actually awesome. It's awesome. And I remember as a kid, I was like, but God is terrible. God is ter and it used to scare me. I was like, because I was getting it from the word of God. That's exactly what it said. God is terrible. But if you go to the actual Hebrew word of that, it's actually awesome. So I just wanted to put that out there because some people may be thinking like I was, oh my gosh, God is terrible. God, that word is God is awesome. You know, his ways are awesome. So thank you for that, Reggie. I, I'm, I'm glad you said that. Also, <laughs> also, where he is, he is actually on Mount Horeb. Does anybody know another name for Mount Horeb? I will give you a hint. Um, there was a man that went up there and received Ten Commandments. Mount Horeb is also Mount Sinai. Yes. Now, is, and so think about it, you know, this is also, an Eli, Elijah understands the significance of being on Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai and what took place there. You know, when Moses received the Ten Commandments, what happened? There was thunder and lightning and clouds and God was speaking and it was a, it was a big thing. So that's the reason why Elijah is thinking that God is going to show himself in such a big and awesome and mighty and mighty way, but God doesn't do that. Instead, God revealed God's self in a still 
small voice. And when Elijah heard the voice of the Lord, he covered himself with his mantle. And so this mantle, it was a garment that he wore over his clothes. It was similar to a robe. And so when he was in the face of the Lord, he covered himself um, to protect himself, yes, but also in, in, in awe of him and in honor of him as well, he covered himself. And God told him um, in that still small voice, Elijah, you are not alone. There are 7,000 of you in Israel who have not bowed their, their heads to Baal. And so what does this say to us today? You know, we, we sometimes can't see the trees because of the forest. Has anybody ever heard that saying before? You can't see the trees because of the forest. It means that we're in too close of a proximity to see what is, is going on. We can't get so consumed that we, we don't see um, others. You know, um, when we think about this succession and, and our exhaustion sometimes because of what it is that we're doing, we can't, um, we can't get so consumed or self-consumed that we, we don't see that there are that can come to our aid, that can stand with us, that, that can also be partners with us in ministry. And again, whatever your ministry is, so many times we take so much on ourselves because we don't think, or even don't even want to ask, or let someone else know that it's a lot. It's a lot that we're dealing with. We need some help. And, I said it before, and this is the same, I will continue to say it until I'm blowing my face and until people really understand it, that ministry is not an I thing. It's not a me thing. It's a we thing. Um, and if we're standing alone in our ministries, you are going to get exhausted. You're not going to make it. You are going to burn yourself out. Um, and you can see it because other people will see it. There, you begin to have ill feelings and bad attitudes um, because you're trying to do it all by yourself. It's not an I thing. So if you are currently trying to do a ministry, whether it's your marriage, whether it's your business, whether it's even your functions at the church, wherever it is, and you keep doing an I, 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 you got a problem. Find the we in it. And I, I just want to pause right there so that we get that. Find the we in it. Ministry is not about I. All right. And so Elijah, Elijah didn't see it because he could only focus on what his feelings were. He couldn't, he couldn't see past his past what his natural eyes could see that there was that there was others he he didn't know so um it's a good thing he did call upon the lord and that the lord answered him and and revealed to him that there's others here there's others that can help you and as god finishes his instructions to elijah he says to elijah you shall anoint okay son of shaphat of Abel Mehola, Me, Me, can't say his last name, to anoint Elisha as prophet in your place. And so that's where I actually want to go right now. Um, Elijah, um, Elijah, he actually, he does what him to do. Let's read this if we can. In Elijah set out for the son of Shaphat, who was plowing. They, there were 12 yoke of oxen ahead of him, and he was with the 12. Passed by him and threw his mantle over him, and after Elijah, and said, Let me kiss my father and follow you. Then Elijah said to him, Go back again. But what have I done to you? He returned from following him, took the yoke of ox, using the equipment from the oxen. He boiled their flesh, ate, 
Then he set out and followed Elijah, his servant. Elisha was not doing at the time Elijah doing. And why think about Antioch and beyond? Elisha, Elisha was clowning. He, he wasn't a, a prophet that sense, right? He was out there. Folks who may be doing variant, um, they may have skills that we don't think are important. They may be areas that we don't perceive value, or they may, period. They may be a young boy. They may be a Mary. They may be a tax collector. They may be a fisherman like Peter. They Rahab. Or in this case, um, a field hand like Eli, that God can use him. God can use a test by him and he threw. So what did this actually mean when he threw his mantle? What was he doing? Anybody want to? was bringing him in as like his, his um, ministry helper. Absolutely. So, and, and, it, and he him as a spiritual son. Yeah. Yep. But Elijah was going to do for all that he knew about ministry, all that he knew about the Lord walk with the Lord, his anointing and his calling into Elisha, he says goodbye to his old way of life and for the next six um, Elijah had put up a succession so for and receive a double portion of Elijah and so we, we see a relationship with Elijah. He was one, you know, not of high regard. He wasn't a pastor. He wasn't a deacon. He wasn't even a, a prophet. Um, the office of prophet. But yeah, he was a servant. Well, I, I, I like I like the teaching Elisha about first you have to be a servant. You know, to become a good leader, a servant first. Straight into the presidency. You know, you start with you don't walk straight into be, being a worker first. Since that are, are being learned. And here we, are, we learn how to be compassionate and how it's here where, you know, our fortitude is happening. Complexities of ministry, or we learn that hands on that needs to be done. Listening, and we're following those that have Second Kings, chapter two, after six. 
following Elijah, being his mentor. Elisha in Elijah's stead. If the work would continue, or if the work was going to continue down or forsaken or forgotten. He prepared request was granted. Um, this was not for Elisha to boast about more ministry and me than his predecessor mantle was not just looking of his investor that was into at, now now that he re so that fell upon him as Elijah the chariot into heaven now office of the prophet on adoption as a son here's the I'll stop sharing my, my screen so on as church leaders as community leaders, who mantle on to, to, to stand in our stead? Out there to, to, to everyone in our Who are we throwing our mantle on? We should be one. Question for the evening. Any questions? Any comments? Um, And some people can be able to pass things, but there is. I teach our 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 pre something about you know what's in. Happens past college. We teach our thirty-year-olds about math. Children, I think that every each the generations before. We really need to think about this as we. world that seems to be conscience and not God conscience to stand in believers we are Christians Very different than the world to the next generations or even we're standing next to. We thank you, Lord, for your word.